Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 184, with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you guys doing? Hope you're well, hope you are rested, well hydrated, well lubricated, nice and limber. You've done your stretches in the morning, you've done a bit of guided meditation, you've looked out of your window, you've held out your arms out the window to get some well needed vitamin d but then you looked up to the sky and saw that it was completely gray so you're probably not going to get that vitamin d whatever you're doing right now this morning i hope you are well and if you listen to this in the afternoon hope you're enjoying your lunch if you listen to this in the evening hope you're enjoying your evening i am your host agostino zinger and this is my podcast as you can tell by the tone of my voice i'm a little bit pissed off today a little bit sad a little bit disappointed um a little bit confused and very, very worried. Why, you may ask. Why, I guess, you know, are you worried on a Wednesday? Why would you be worried on a Wednesday? Oh, Wednesday. I keep saying it's Wednesday. I just look at the fucking clock. It's Thursday. <laughs> anyway, scrap what I said earlier. Thursday morning, Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, it's Thursday. I'm a little bit angry and a little bit upset. I really shouldn't be. Um, today is one of those weird days where you're meant to celebrate the the day that you popped out your mum's belly, and this is one of those days for me, also known as your birthday. Um, I'm not a real big birthday person, so you are not going to get any big celebrations from me whatsoever. So if you're looking for that, go to another channel. Um, if you're waiting to hear me say it, I'm not going to hear. I'm not going to say it, etc., 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 etc. I'm a grown man. I, I don't. I've got a problem with grown ass people, you know, eagerly celebrating their birthday. I think if you're an adult and you're celebrating your birthday, there's something incredibly wrong with you. Don't celebrate your birthday. You're a grown up. Um, you know, get a drink, have a shot, um, toast yourself for another year of you. You know, successfully um, staving away death or whatever maybe. Um, managing to still be gainfully employed, um, even though you're probably, um, even though you you recognize you probably might not be the nicest person to hang around with. You have friends, even though you know you're a pain in the ass. You have a partner. Do you know what I mean? Even though, um, I don't know, you're not the best owner in the world, you have a dog or something. I don't know. There's things to be grateful for and take toast up to the sky or to yourself too. But in general, I like to keep it moving. Anyway, with that being said, um, the reason why the, the birthday celebrations are a little bit tainted is because of the result yesterday. So I'm going to get straight into it. Get this out of the way and then talk about other stuff because I don't want to keep talking about this kind of bullshit. But um, yeah, so Man United played um, Man City yesterday and we lost comprehensively. Man United played Man, Man United played Man City at home. Um, it was billed as the title decider. It was billed as the most important game of the season for Man City because it was the you know the 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 fourth to last game. Well, you know um, a game a run of games where they could essentially have the title back in their control as long as they got past us. It, um, what people thought was that the fixtures coming up afterwards were ones that they could win, even though they're going to face Burnley and all that sort of stuff. You know, difficult teams they're going to face. They probably thought the banana skin could be against United, even though we haven't been playing well. A local derby is always a local derby. Tensions run high. Everyone's going to want to prove themselves. There's a new manager under in Solskjaer at the helm. Uh, players are going to want to play for him. They don't want to be kicked out of the club. Blah, blah, blah. A lot at stake, right? So a lot was built about this game. Enough. And in, in, to be honest, for the first time ever, I didn't get caught up in the hype. I have to be completely honest. I did not get caught up in the hype. I was very much aware of where we are as a team. I think that three month period in the beginning where Solskjaer came in and essentially was the good guy um, versus Mourinho's bad guy role, or he was a good cop, bad. He was a good cop um, in comparison to Mourinho being a bad cop. That worked for three months because, you know, he, he came in as like the bright, shiny supply teacher who everyone kind of got along with. We kind of let you kind of come into class three minutes late sometimes. We let you go out to lunch a little bit earlier. He earned everyone's trust that way. But I think in general, the issue that we have here is that the team just isn't good enough, right? We don't have players good enough to make the difference. We don't have players good enough that can take the mantle on of Manchester United. We don't have the players good enough to make the change. And we ultimately don't have players good enough to play the style of football that even um, Solskjaer wants to play at the moment. Because I think this counter-attacking football, you need a different type of footballer to, to kind of make that system work, especially when things aren't going well. So I wasn't that confident about the game. But, you know, I go into it with quite optimism and think, you know what? You never know. We start off pretty well, to be honest. We start off the first 15 minutes are pretty good. We're putting some decent pressure on City. We're kind of making them shaky. Straight away, we realise that Vincent Company is a weak link in the defence, maybe because of his injury record, maybe because he's just getting on in age. But he was a weak link. Not, not to say he's, he's as bad as Jones or Smalling, but in that City team, he's probably the weakest link in the team and someone we could probably get at. We saw Kyle Walker leaving loads of space as he was bombing forward or sometimes, you know, his concentration goes, and he drifts inside sometimes. So we saw that there was opportunity for us to punish them. But as per usual with United, 
we don't tend to punish teams when we see a weakness. I think the old United of, of yesteryear, and, and I think as most great teams, as you see them, what they tend to do is that when a team is on the ropes, when a team is kind of a bit shaky, when a team exposes a vulnerability to them, um, sometimes through no fault of their own, the good team tends to always punish them. Always. It's a standard kind of trait you see. It's usually in European football games, especially at a high level, when someone makes a mistake, it doesn't go unpunished, right? Because usually the best players are able to pounce on that and the best players kind of live for those moments, especially when they're training. They have that in mind that, you know, even though you're facing... Because, for instance, think of, it, think of a Champions League game. You're going to be facing some of the best teams in the world, right? Or the best teams in Europe. You're going to come across some of the best players in the world. So it's likely that they're going to be able to shut you out of the game through no fault of your own. So you have to keep in mind when you're a great player that you're going to get one opportunity. They're going to make one mistake. You're going to force them into making an error. You're going to skip past them one time. You have to make it count. So we didn't make it count. Um, we had a couple of kind of half chances where the final ball really let us down. We didn't really um, get the ball to the players that they needed to get. And let me actually get a lineup here so I can comment on some of the players and go through some player ratings. But we didn't, we didn't kind of, we didn't punish them the way we should have punished them in order to kind of make really make a difference. And then as as it as the game progressed, you and you always thought that City were always kind of in second gear. It reminded me a little bit of the Barcelona game, um, especially the second leg. Um, it felt like Barcelona were always in second gear, that they were when they wanted to score, they would... I mean, when Man City wanted to score, they could score. And then inevitably, in the second half, we came out and you could tell that I think the endurance, level, the fitness level, sorry, had dipped considerably, um, which is very concerning because I didn't, we didn't do that much running, really, if you, if you look at it. I don't think City moved us around as much as they have done with other teams. They didn't really stretch us all over the pitch. Um, for the most part, the midfield were doing most of the running. Some sometimes it was Lingard and Rashford, but our whole team looked completely shot when they came out for the second half. Um, some of them might be planning their holidays. I don't know what's going on, but either way, we didn't look like we we're a team that was going to um, punish City or were able to kind of score. We probably would have, if we were going to score, it was going to come from a set piece or something. Uh, City then end up scoring a goal through Bernardo Silva, a very well taken goal. Some commentators on I've been watching on uh, on the TV and stuff have been saying that oh um, David De Gea should have done should have done a bit better with the goal. I don't agree at all. I think that was an incredibly great uh, that was an incredible finish by Bernardo Silva. If you look if you check the goal again quickly, if you check the goal again on the replay, he approaches um, Shaw on his left foot and that and and and, and um, what do you call it? Um, purposely runs towards him. Takes carries the ball exactly that like super direct runs it directly to him. Kind of reminds me of what um, Iron Robin does when he's kind of scoring that bendy kind of goal that he always does. He always kind of runs directly towards the defender, then at the last minute dinks it out left and then bends it around. Because what then happens if you look at it from the goalkeeper's point of view, the, the goalkeeper knows the shot's coming, but they don't know when it's coming. So by the time the goalkeeper realised that he's dinked it to the left, it's already it's already left his boot. And he can't save it by that time. And what made uh, Bernard Silva's finish even more impressive, it reminded me of the shot that Rooney used to do a lot in the early in the early stages of his United career, but he kind of wasn't able to finish it in the latter stages. That kind of shot that Rooney does where he pushes the ball out and then instead of and then instead of shooting on a two step, he shot he shoots kind of on a one and a half step on a one step and he always goes for the near post and the far post. Because that kind of technique they're usually shooting with when you're kind of like cutting in usually you're aiming for the top corner of the opposite side you're shooting towards, like usually towards sorry, um, towards the left-hand side. You're not usually trying to cut it near post. You're trying to cut it to the far post. It's just a really clever technique, and I think you just caught out David De Gea. It's a really, really clever technique. I don't think you can blame David De Gea for that. Maybe in yesteryears when David De Gea was getting voted our best player of the season, 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 best player of the year, season, season out, he might have been able to save that. But I think David De Gea of, now, of nowadays, probably not. And I just think it was a very good finish. So that, that was a crucial moment because I think we could have then, straight after that goal, we had a couple of opportunities with Lingard where we could have where we could have scored. One opportunity, he kind of fluffed his lines, didn't get it, didn't part, didn't, uh, wasn't able to control it. He kind of ran uh, in front of the ball. Then a second chance was the one that was just unex, unex, um, unacceptable, really. The one where the ball came across the goal and he just completely missed, missed kicked it and it went out of play. And then from then on, you just felt as if like we were never going to score because we needed that quick reaction to kind of get us back into the game. It was never going to happen. And then, um, of course, uh, City have a have an injury that forces them into bringing on the player. And instead of bringing on a like for like substitution for Fernandino, they bring on Leroy Sané, who I'm sure everyone in the stadium was like afraid when he came on. And immediately, Ashley Young was completely getting ripped on that side. For instance, well, to be honest, Ashley Young did hold his own quite well when Sané came on, but just the threat of Sané out there, out wide, really, really h hugging the touchline was something that a lot of our defenders couldn't handle. And they kind of, and City moved us around really well in the counter-attack. Sterling kind of brings it forward. Um, Sergio Aguero does an amazing run. He 
pulls all the, all our defenders to one side. Sterling whips the ball out wide to Sane, and Sane just goes for pure power and somehow manages to like burst the ball completely through uh, David Gea. Even though David Gea's foot saves that he usually does are uh, his kind of staple uh, goalkeeping. Um, uh, choice didn't actually work this time so essentially we got beat very thoroughly there was no way we we're going to come back uh if if there's any fault for the manager so also maybe brought any substitutions a bit late um i think we had uh lukaku and Martial come on and i think lukaku sorry and sanchez come on an 80 second minute lukaku came on after the second goal they're probably too late of a substitution i think i would have made a change straight i think i would have made a change after lingard missed those two chances because i think it was very fairly obvious we weren't going to create anything again we need to kind of disrupt her city style city's play pause the game bring on bring a couple of the fresh faces and then try again that way but it just didn't work out it didn't happen we were we were beaten by the far better side and um, i'd say moving on quickly to play ratings um looking at the lineup now um player ratings well i'd give david Gea maybe a free again i don't think he was at fault for this that uh for the bernardo silver goal no I, i'm gonna give him a four he wasn't at fault for the bernardo silver goal um he was at fault maybe for the leroy sunny goal but again he hit, hit with a lot of power his distribution wasn't great but i just think he just plays with the team or with defenders that aren't good with receiving the ball under pressure so that's probably why he's under pressure kicking the ball out too so his balls have to be inch, pinch um, inch perfect to reach their de reach their destination and even if they are there's no guarantee the player is going to receive it like Fred's really small uh, you can't really hold the ball up well Pogba can do it well but again you're asking you're you're getting you're isolating our best player and making him get surrounded by three players which isn't beneficial um sending it long to Pereira isn't a good idea either so I just think his distribution isn't helped by the players that are in front of him so I'll probably give him a four Ashley Young was his usual terrible self he didn't do that much bad but it's consistently bad and I think the concerning thing about Ashley Young is the lack of attention he gets from pundits uh, Gary Neville said the other day we shouldn't focus on Ashley Young because we have other players who should be stepping up and doing more than what Ashley Young is doing but we should be focused on him because he's the one that constantly gets picked he shouldn't be getting picked that's that's the problem he's that bad he shouldn't be playing I don't care about his experience he can't play at right back um he can't cross he can't pass the ball he's horrible going forward and this is the thing that's really weird about Ashley Young it's like I don't expect him to be a good defender he's a converted winger He's a converted winger into a right back. I don't expect him to be a good defender. I don't think any Man United fans should sit there and say we expect um, Ashley Young to be a version of Cafu. That isn't going to happen. He's not going to be that player. Cool. But what we expect is for him to be at least good at attacking. The thing that he was doing back in the day when he used to be a winger, right? You expect him to be, okay, if he's not going to be a good defender, at least the the best thing he can do is that when he pushes the ball out of his feet and gets away from the defender, he whips in a mean cross. Fine, that's okay. But he can't even do that. The best cross he did probably the whole season was a free kick he took in the first half. Or no, sorry, in the second half. That um that that whip took that kind of landed on the penalty spot. Inch perfect cross. Um our uh Rashford didn't really make good movement to run onto it. Our uh, all our players were kind of behind the Man City players, and uh I think um uh, company was able to knock it out. But apart from that, really abject performance. I'm gonna give him a four. Uh, Damian was surprisingly quite solid again a player who probably should play a lot more than what he's getting played I know he's not as good as any other player that we have he's, he's not he's nowhere near the level of Man United I understand that but you have to pick between Ashley Young and Matteo Damian I'm picking Matteo Damian every day of the week I know what I get from him he's a terrible defender but he also tries to get forward he isn't afraid to get the ball under pressure he puts his head where it hurts he's good he's strong in the tackle he's a bit he's a bit cynical because of his Italian roots and stuff he can be a little bit you know he, he's getting the ship he's point he's terrible and i understand all around he's terrible It's the reason why he hasn't played that much but he should be playing ahead of ashley young especially if we're not going to play the kids if you're not going to play the kids because you want experience play play damian damian should play so i'll give him a five smalling was fucking garbage again not much wrong defensively but the issue is that because of his lack of calmness because he can't because he can't play with the ball from the back because he can't receive the ball at his feet we are so deep as a team we receive the ball so so deep because Pogba doesn't have to pick it up from him because he can't bring it forward he's really really bad and this goes to explain why the gay's distribution is so shit because he can't pass the ball to Smalling he just can't pass the ball to him because he's not going to be able to play out wide he's not going to be able to play out to anyone for uh Lindelof fairly quiet did not didn't do that much wrong maybe a five Luke Shaw pretty terrible going forward didn't really take on his man didn't really offer an outlet on the left hand side was incredibly timid he looked like he didn't really want to get ripped by his players four um Pereira 
probably never a main United um, starter. He's probably a good squad player in the same vein as Fred. I think they're two players who give their all. Their two players are always showing for the ball. So I'm very, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to them because when I see them play, they're always showing for the ball, even in tight spaces. They want to receive it. They're trying to make a change. You can tell that, you know, you can tell from the defeat at Everton till now, he's probably been one of our best trainers. He's probably been running around, getting into tackles, scoring goals. He's a player that I'm sure a lot of managers, when they come in new, would want him in their team because he gives his absolute all and he loves playing for the club. Um, he's probably just not technically at a level it needs to be uh, for us to win top honours. This particular game, he did not, he did, he did, um, he, he had some misplaced passes. He was a bit slow in possession. He should have shot sometimes when he carried a ball sometimes, but overall, I'll give him a five. Uh, Fred, same thing too. Probably his most courageous performance, but I think someone mentioned it earlier that Man City wanted to buy him a few seasons ago, a couple of seasons ago. So I think it shows in the way that they kind of marked him out of the game. Every time he got the ball, they sort of like closed him down, didn't give him, give him time to get the ball out of his feet. He's not the quickest to getting the ball out of his feet and looking up, but when he does get time, he's very good on the ball. Um, he was making loads of forward passes, I think probably more than any other player outside of Pogba. So I'm very, I'm very thankful for that. So I'll give him a five again. Uh, Paul Pogba was fairly good, I think. And again, he gets scapegoated a lot because I think he's because of the price tag. But I think um, he was again. It, I don't really agree with his ratings or votes, but he was voted PFA in the PFA player team of the year. The only Man United player to get in that team, and I think it's for a reason, right? He's a good player. He's probably our only world class player in that team, apart from David Gea, who's kind of suffering a crisis of confidence at the moment. Um, and he tries. He's really trying to get his foot on the ball. He's trying to make a difference, but the players just aren't good enough to kind of help him make that change. Um, he did try a few uh, passes over the top that kind of went to nowhere. He did try a few passes to some people that didn't go anywhere. He did lose possession sometimes, but I think every time he loses possession, you always have to look who is actually in front of him. And sometimes we can't see on the TV cameras, but there was no options. No one was making intelligent runs. Smalling and Russia were just running around like headless tickets. I mean, Smalling and Lingard and Russia were running around like headless chickens. So I'll give him probably a six. I think so, because he was trying at least to do something and you could tell, you know, that maybe it's just his heart is not in it and he's probably already decided he's going to go somewhere else. Rashford, again, pretty terrible. He's been terrible for a while. No one's really talking about it because I guess he's the golden child in the same way of Harry Kane, but he's been pretty shit. Um, again, no real intelligence when he's on the ball. His footballing IQ is really low. He's kind of similar in the vein of Lukaku, I think, in the fact that if you don't give him time to think, you just feed him balls for him to run onto and sprint and just smash balls in the top corner. He's amazing. But I think if you give him time to think and stuff and it's not instinctual, it's not one, two touch football, he doesn't know what to do. Case in point, there was a bit, I think, in the second half or the first half where it was kind of it was about to be two on one. And um, uh, Lingard was trying to decide where to run to kind of make the spaces. And Rashford just decided to like kick it and run past um, somebody and he got completely out of, the, out, of the, out of bounds. It was like, what are you doing? Just carry the ball a bit further out the pitch and make the and make the defender make you a, make the uh, uh, force the defender into making a choice of what he what he wants to do. Then commit him and then maybe nip it past, get a free kick or a pen, and then kind of square it off to Lingard, wherever it may be. But I just think his footballing IQ isn't there. And talking about footballing IQ, just lack of quality, Jesse Lingard. There was a time in day right where I saw on some forums again. I'm only I'm only going to mention forum stuff because I don't know if it's social media people saying it. But I remember there was a time of day, or there was a time when the and we were getting links with Antoine Griezmann, and everyone was saying, "Oh, we don't need Griezmann. We've got Lingard, right?" Because they kind of occupy the same sort of role in the team. That kind of second striker, false nine, that in, in between the, that that little hole a position just behind the two strikers. And some people were saying, "Oh, we don't need um, Griezmann. We've got Lingard." And I think games like this and other games as well, you might have seen sometimes even playing for England, the la the sometimes the quality, he's a good player, right? He tries his heart out, um, he runs a lot. But I think just the the top level quality needed to really make a difference in the big games, Lingard just doesn't have it. That chance across the box, I'm sorry, you just finish it. You just score and your team gets one your kid team is one all. Uh, they don't deserve to be one all, and then we go again. You just score that goal. It's not that big of a chance to miss, really, in that respect. And I think outside of that, his runs, the way he shows for the ball, how he plays one twos, his lack of his passing range isn't as good as it probably should be. Um, his control isn't where it should be. His decision making when he's got the ball in the final third isn't where it should be. He just isn't at the level that we need. Again, a good squad player in the same vein as Rashford, Pereira, Fred, great squad players. Even Damian, even Shaw, good squad players. But as in, as in, to form the overall nucleus of your side, no way, Jose. They can't be. They can't be the players that we that we aim to take forward. So I think overall, I'll probably just give him a four or five. I don't know. Let's get to a four. 
Um, the subs, no point even mentioning them really. Lukaku was absolute garbage when he came on. Control, like it's he reminds me of Fellaini, like in that worst possible sense. Everything just bounces off of him. Uh, Sanchez and Marshall had no time to come on. It was very uh, no time to make a difference. Maybe Solskjaer did wrong there, but I'm not really going to blame him too much because I don't think any difference, any change could have made any any difference at all. Um, but it's very telling how angry Marshall looked when he came on. He was furious. He definitely thought he should have played from the beginning. But again, he was fucking shit against Everton and he got dropped rightfully so because he didn't play well. Um, so that's the player ratings done and out of the way. Um, and on to the kind of future business of United. So um, just to kind of wrap this up, I'm worried, right? And I'm worried because it seems like, especially in the recent years, I think people have started to realise, I think Man United fans like myself and others who were calling for Wayne Rooney to be sold before he got that new contract, who were up in arms when Smalley Jones got offered new contracts and people were saying that we don't need defenders because we were playing well that first three months, we just need attacking players. For the people that were saying those kind of things, the ones that were kind of upset that we sold Daily Blind, um, uh, the ones that we were the ones that were pissed off that Fellaini was still on our team, even though the pundits and journalists were telling us Fellaini is a good option and he offers something different. We are we were, we've always kind of known this day would come, but I, we didn't. I don't think all of I don't think us United fans knew how big the issue was. I don't think we knew the scale of the rebuild needed to take us to the next level or to have us even. I've, I've been mentioning on social media a couple of times, uh, especially yesterday. I was going on, on a few rants. It's not even what we need in order to win again. It's what we need in order just to compete, just to be in a conversation. In the same way like Tottenham are, right? No one expects Tottenham to win the league, especially with the, with the budget they have. But just to be in the, com in the conversation, to be in amongst that conversation, to like take points off the top four, to, to be in a good run of games, to um, get to the latter stages of the European um, uh, uh, Championships, to get to the stages of the, of the League Cup, of the FA Cup, on, and to fight on all those fronts. We need so much work in that overall team, in the club of how it looks at things and the mentality, the psyche, that it really boggles belief. It, it's really starting to worry me that, that they decide to go with Solskjaer for this job. Because I think it's a, I think especially when, especially when Mourinho failed, because I think when you look at it from the managers that we've hired and fired, we hired, um, you know, David Moyes, who was kind of like, you know, the steady Eddie, uh, reliable Everton man, a Premier League manager who kind of got Everton to finish in the top 10 or top six consistently over a number of years with a limited transfer budget. And uh, thinking was, you know, he with those modest means, guess what he could do? Guess we, we only um, wonder what he could do at Man United. Once he got there, he was never really Man United level. You could never really adapt to that level of football, to that level of kind of prestige, to the pressures, to whatever. Maybe he just couldn't handle that platform. And he right, he so got sacked. Like terrible manager, I think so far. Managers, you should always judge them not by the job that they got sacked by, but their overall body of work. And judging by the amount of teams he's been hired and fired by, the fact that he's got no job now and doesn't seem like he's going to get one very soon, especially in the in the in the new era of football that we're in now, goes to show that he was a terrible choice in the first place. Then you get Louis Van Gaal, who's got a footballing philosophy, comes from a school at the the, the, the Ajax Academy of football, total football, the, to, total football, the kind of football that we kind of hoped that we kind of would play, would evolve into, especially after the spankings we got from Barcelona in two thousand nine and two thousand eleven. That didn't work out. Then you go for Mourinho, who's like the, the reliable choice, right? Everywhere he's gone, he's won a championship, right? You give him money, you let him do what he wants with the, with the squad, he hires, him, he hires and fires who he wants, and he will deliver you a championship. This is what his CV has shown us, right? And he couldn't do it. Now, don't get me wrong, he came during the time of a very adept um, Man City, um, steered by a very, you know, one of the best coaches in the world, if not the best coach in the world in Pep Guardiola, fair, with owners who are willing and able to give him um, any any amount of money he wants to keep the club going, cool. But if Mourinho couldn't do it, and he couldn't get the players that he wanted to, he couldn't get the players in he wanted to, the players he did get in who are, were fucking garbage, he didn't get time to maybe rewrite his wrongs, because, you know, again, we can't really wait around for him to kind of get better. It kind of makes you think that they probably should have gone for a manager who was able to rebuild something of this stature because this is going to take a lot of rebuild. Not only do you have to replace, let's say, maybe six first team players. I'm looking at the lineup now, and you'd probably, if imagine if David De Gea goes, you're going to need an, another sub, sub goalkeeper behind Romero, unless maybe you take him on the kids and bring those back. Um, you're going to need a replacement for Young and Damian. You're going to need a replacement for Smalling. That's free. You're going to need competition for Lindelof and or a partner and Shaw. Um, so you've already got four players there in the back line. You're going to probably need to replace one of Pogba, Fred or Pereira because one of them are going to probably go. Two of them are probably going to stay and be squad players. You're probably going to need to replace or um, make um, two options or one option up front that's going to replace Lukaku, Rashford, Lingard or Sanchez. 
Like, there's so much work to be done in that team. It's going to take a lot of foresight and a lot of, like, vision, a really long pl- game plan to kind of really get it back to where it needs to be. And I think at the moment, with the rumours coming out that Mike Feeling, a person that was, uh, you know, coaching in the Australian League before he came back to Man United, a person who, even when he was at Man United, was ra- uh, widely regarded as a bit of a joke, is suddenly now be- held in as some coaching genius who can somehow manage to scout all these players and have a football philosophy and n- able to identify the weak points in our team. I just don't get it. I just I don't understand it. I don't understand why. And again, I'm not being knee jerk here, but I just I'm just I'm just not so sure if Solskjaer is going to be the man for the job. It's a really really big managerial job to do. It's not just about signing three or four players. Get us because if that was if Solskjaer was given the Tottenham job, it would probably make a lot more sense, right? Because he just needs to keep that keep that momentum, keep them in and around the top six. Maybe sign a couple of players, move a couple of players on. And he's probably he's probably done a good job, right? If he finishes fifth again next season with Tottenham off fourth, he's probably done a good job. No one's going to be moaning in the Tottenham stands, right? They have a good, another good European competition. But to take Man United from six now, if we finish outside the top, up top four, which I'm not bothered about, I don't get why some fans are obsessed with the top four. Why should we get in the Champions League if we're just not going to compete and make up the numbers? It doesn't make any sense. Yes, the European night, but it's, it's a waste of time. We shouldn't turn into Arsenal. We want to be in these competitions to win this. We don't want to just be there for the sake of being there. Um, doesn't make it, I'd rather just not get top four and just start again. Um, and then not getting the top four as well, we're, we're obviously going to force the Glazers' hand because they're not going to get the Champions League money, which is the only thing they're really worried about. And Ed Woodward will look bad again, um, which I'm, I'm surprised his job isn't under threat either because, you know, he's been absolutely garbage. But um, yeah, I just, I just don't, I just, um, it's going to take a lot of time. It's a big rebuild. I spent about half an hour talking about it. It's half an hour too much of my time. And um, yeah, I just don't know what, what what the future holds. We've got Chelsea now on Sunday. People are still thinking we're going to win that. I don't know why you think we're going to win that. I don't think we're going to win another game this entire season. Probably going to draw a couple. Um, we're completely shot. Our players don't want to be there. Pogba looks like he wants to go, which I don't blame him if he wants to go. He's clearly our best player in the team. I think every time he gets on the ball, he looks up. There's no running. There's no movement. He has to, he has to run all the way back to defence and receive the ball. He doesn't receive the ball further up the pitch because our... Defenders can't bring the ball out. Um, we've got terrible players all over the park. We've got average players all over the park. We seem to have a, a, a club infrastructure that doesn't really accommodate for foresight or vision. I don't really hear any murmurs out there. Because I remember there was a time in the first three months where we were doing really well and then rumours were coming out that we don't need a defender anymore. We've identified we don't need a defender. We just need to take, get attacking players. It's like, no, we do need defenders. You can't play counter-attacking football, sit deep and have shit defenders. Even if you don't want defenders that can play out from the back, you need to have defenders that can defend if you're going to sit that deep. It doesn't make any sense. Like, And if anything, we're probably a bit too top-heavy. Like, We could probably get away with signing an entire back four and not signing one attacking player. We'll probably be a lot better than what we are now. I guarantee you. We get four new defenders right, to cover that entire back four that are starters, not squad players, absolute first-teamers. right? Wan Bissaka, um, <coughs> um, Harry Maguire, Toby Alderwell, maybe keep Shaw, like keep those, get a whole new defence and suddenly our team is transformed. But to say that we don't need any defenders, we don't need more attackers to, to get us the top, no, it's not true. You could stick Sergio Aguero up front for us. It's not going to work because we don't get the ball to him. We're not going to play the way that he was, what he wanted to get the ball to him in the first place. Our defend, we defend it too deep. So it's just like, again, I'm really disturbed. I don't know. It's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of time. We've got players that aren't going to want to move. <laughs> For I've got a weird suspicion that players like Smalling and Jones have a very delusional sense of self. I've got a feeling that they are they got, they really do think that they're of main at equality. I remember Jones coming out and saying something that really irked me one time about how he deserves to start or something. These players are fucking delusional. They're absolutely delusional. They don't have an absolute scooby what level they're at because they've never been able to play with top class players since Sass really uh, retired. They haven't had that real pressure. They've always been, they've kind of been relied on. Um, they've been they've survived three managers so I guess in your head if you're a player you probably would say oh if I if I've survived three managers obviously I'm rated like what Smalling said when he wasn't picked for the England squad to go to the Euros let's go to World Cup right England even Gareth Southgate doesn't pick him to for, for England I, think, I remember him saying something along the lines of oh well I start for Man United it's the biggest club in the world I don't care about England it's like you only start for us because we've got inept owners we got we don't have we don't have a, an infrastructure that can identify what we what style we want to play at what style we want to play, the players that can play that style, the players that can't and ship them out. We don't know. So we have to keep you because we don't have any other assets in our team to really start ahead of you. And somehow this guy's going to get a, a fucking testimonial. Wow. Wow. But anyway, um, that's enough for Man United. I, I don't sure where it's going to happen, what's going to go on from now on, but it's a big job for Oli. I really hope he does well and he succeeds, but I'm just not too sure it's going to work out. But hey. 
Anyway, uh, moving on in, moving on up. Let's get out of that because it's already bummed me out. See, his football bums me out so quickly. It's, like, ugh. it's weird how, how quickly football bums me out. It makes me so upset. You start just getting upset about things that don't really concern you or you can't really affect in that regard, right? I can't really affect um, anything that what happens in football. What can I do, right? Any projects that we've done before, you know, the the golden green uh, scarves and shit didn't work. Even we even got managed to get David fucking Beckham to wear them, and nothing changed. It's just a fucking bizarre and really annoying time to be a United fan, man. I just I don't know, man. Just from it just has all the markings of like you know, AC Milan into Milan's decline over the years. Like just <sighs> Valencia to some to a certain extent. Like these big 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 teams just suddenly. Just, you know, being steered in an absolute wrong direction and suddenly over a number of years, like, you know, it's going to be maybe close to a decade, right, since we've maybe last won the league. It's probably going to take that long. It's already been seven seasons, right? Um, or seven years, I think, since we last won the Premier League. It can easily, it could easily be, it could easily get up to a decade. Easily. Wow. Wow. Anyway, moving on, moving on in. What else can we talk about here? What have I seen that I wanted to mention to you guys that I thought was awesome? Oh, yeah, Supreme, man. Supreme. Supreme 21st anniversary. 25th anniversary, sorry, 21st. 25th anniversary, right? I'm sure some of you guys have seen it, but Supreme are releasing this amazing box work to celebrate 25th anniversary, which I wasn't aware of what that was, which is fucking nuts, isn't it? Which means that 25th, the 25th anniversary t-shirt that came out a while back, that felt like just yesterday, innit? Time has gone by like a fucking flash. Crazy. Anyway, so Supreme announced the news um, the other day about their 25th anniversary uh, shirt that they're putting out, which is here on the screen, modelled by the great Larry Clark, who was the director for Kids, the seminal movie that sort of kind of, you know, uh, spoke to or inspired um, Supreme. Um, 25th anniversary of Supreme anniversary. In April 1994, Supreme opened its doors to Lafayette in the Lafayette Street uh, uh, in downtown Manhattan, becoming the home of New York skate culture, which is, you know, it's, it's a fucking humble brag, but it's super true. At its core was a group of neighborhood kids, skaters, and local artists who came who became the store's staff, crew, and customers. Over 25 years, Supreme has expanded from its New York City origins into a global community with 11 stores around worldwide and an even larger network of friends and family that make up the fabric of the brand, which is incredible, right? And that's the that's really the model that most kind of uh, brands, whether they be fashion, whether they be design, uh, whether they be streetwear, that's the model that everyone's trying to copy, right? This Supreme model of somehow taking these, or somehow putting a to put in a store, put in a brand in amongst this local community or plug it into a local community, allowing that local community to, you know, contribute to it, to give and to kind of add to it, take it away, reinterpret it in their own way, and then let it kind of um, grow from there. It's all like similar to the, uh, the Toby Feltwell from CE, from Cave Ent quote that he said the other day on that interview from K um, GQ. He mentioned something along the lines of like, it's not just the brand owner that makes the brand. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way conversation between the brand and the customers, right? It's a constant conversation and the brand sort of evolves. So it starts off as one thing and over time it sort of evolves into this other thing through various bits of dialogue, whether it's from buying patterns, whether it's stuff that people say to you on social media, media, emails, whatever it may be, stuff that you see when you go out, it's all kind of a big conversation. I think Supreme's been really good at doing that. And again, I think why they've been able to kill it over these years, 25 years, is the fact that they've kept things so in-house, even from hiring, right? You never see a Supreme job advertisement on job boards. Everything's done in-house. I know of a couple of people that work at Supreme and all the jobs that come um, all the jobs that are available are only kind of given to people in and around the Supreme network who kind of get it. And the reason why they do that is because you kind of keep that you keep that you keep the company obviously uh lean and efficient but the main important thing about it is that the people that you're bringing in they get the brand they don't need to be you know given a deck they don't need to be given in an induction or training or whatever they understand what the brand is and they immediately can just plug into it and then uh be able to give their input their interpretation of what the brand means to them right so i'm sure the people that work at the supreme store in paris have a different kind of vision of what supreme is to them in their in, um, in their habitat but again it all kind of relates back to the dna of supreme that started off in that little lafayette street in downtown manhattan it's a fucking brilliant brand one of the one of the brands that i think doesn't get enough props as it should do and i think 25 years is in anything is something that shouldn't be like laughed it's something that shouldn't be overlooked I, so doing something for 25 years consistently 
and with having this level of demand and they're still opening more stores and there's rumors of them opening more stores around the world coming up very soon it's just insane what they're doing that insane um anyway it continues uh to commemorate his 25th is 25 years supreme will release a swarovski crystal box logo t-shirt of course they are hoodie sweatshirt uh, and hoodie sweatshirt hoodie sweatshirt uh, features 1002 one the hoodie 1201 swarovski crystals and a t-shirt features 1061 i wonder why there's more crystals on the sweatshirt than there is on a t-shirt when this box logo usually is the same size is it because of the fabric of the t-shirt right i'm assuming that the cotton and then the the material of the hoodie maybe it doesn't you have to maybe put more crystals on the hoodie because maybe it doesn't spread out as much or whatever or there's too much give and stretch maybe i don't know Right, with the, is a hoodie there'll be too much? I don't know. I wonder why there's more crystals on hoodie. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, continue. Crystals are applied by hand in New York City. Wow. Available in store in New York City, Brooklyn, LA, London, Paris, and online April 25th, which is today. Available in Japan uh, on April 27th. And I'll show you the pictures of it. I'm sure some of you have seen it already, but let's look at them anyway. You got here the great Larry Clark modeling a t shirt. It looks fucking awesome, doesn't it? Like, oh so good there's a box logo t-shirt wow in the classic gray that is incredible isn't it really fucking nice man wonder what's gonna feel to that's gonna be so hype it's gonna they're gonna resell for bazillions i think they're like 360 something like that right or 400 i think i saw the prices on the supreme leak thing they got a navy two navy blue a red box logo they're all red this is a classic colorways really the white the, the white t-shirt with the with the salty crystals the one that's probably the best one i think i think that's the that's the most ballerous one i'd love that i'd i'd be all over that man oh that is looks so beautiful get that slightly other side or maybe two sides and then have it tucked into a pair of nice chinos oh that looks so good man so fucking good so yeah that's coming out check it out check it in supreme 25th anniversary t-shirt swarovski crystals all applied by hand in new york obviously you know the connection okay they just get it you know swarovski crystals you know very very um what you call it uh, you can associate that strongly with um, new york city especially if you're a fan of dipset from the early 2000 eras or even going back to the 90s era then you then you get the box logo then you get the classic colorways then you get it all applied by hand it's just like you know they get it they just understand this shit you know like no one other man like supreme are the supreme are supreme are supreme man that's that's basically it man easy the best street brand in the world even now with all the fucking brands out there like everyone's kind of following the footsteps of supreme it's just fucking incredible to see really i'm i'm such a fan such such a fan. and again i just got so much just some huge bits of respect for them man imagine doing this for 25 years and doing it that well it's like wow wow wow, wow, wow. um what else do we feature here uh let's see what else i think looks good uh what's this reese cooper thingamajiggy right huh. i think stuff like again maybe it's my um maybe it's my arrogance and i probably shouldn't say this sort of stuff but i think personally seeing i, I, I think if you're a kid out there and you design clothes if you see stuff like this reese cooper um collection uh you know he's got he's designed an, an exclusive workwear collection for barney's new york capsule i think if you're a kid and you're a designer you have to get some you have to you have to be quite hopeful or you have to be, you know, how do I say this? If you're a kid, right, and you design clothes and you see Reese Cooper's got his stuff stocked in uh, Barney's, you're going to be a little bit pissed, but it also should motivate you. Because this stuff is so, like, basic and, I don't know, it's just like, there's no real identity to it. You don't really know what, you don't really know what you're looking at. You don't really know what's good and what isn't. Um, well, again, it's subjective, but it's just so ordinary so basic i just I, again maybe it's, it's just a, 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 a symptom of just how big streetwear has got that you know st there's, there's stores out there they just need clothes right they need new clothes they need new designers to keep promoting and pushing out there and these kids are just like you know they're, they're, they're effectively just you know um meeting the demand and there's new kids coming into streetwear coming into fashion every single year the kids are getting younger and younger and younger and younger and younger um they're having more disposable income um their parents are maybe a little bit younger too they're having more disposable income to give them the kids are reselling shoes they have the most disposable income so there's a real need and desire for clothes which really spits into the face of um this is sustainability the sustainability movement going on at the moment but some of the stuff that these guys are making is just like 
like garbage, isn't it? Like really. And again, I see his name mentioned quite a lot of places, like Reese Cooper. People, you get co-signed by a lot of people. Again, I have respect for it because I think with me personally, I've always had as aspirations of having my own brand. But as you can tell, me sitting here talking to a webcam on a shitty USB microphone, I haven't got, I haven't had the balls to go out there and put my money where my mouth is and make my own brand. So you kind of have to always applaud people who kind of do the courage, the most courageous thing and put themselves out there, right? I think there's something about criticism that, that's something about criticism that I don't really like where, you know, you just criticize and you don't have the, uh, the respect or the admiration needed to understand that, you know, this kid who is basically a kid has invested his money or even if he's got backed, whatever it may be, he's still risking his reputation uh, to put alongside a brand and to put it out there, to risk the scrutiny of people, to have it not sell well, all that sort of stuff. He's gone out there and done it, but the stuff that they're doing is go 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 garbage, isn't it? Like, this stuff is like so like like, if I went to Barney and I saw this on the shelf next to some of the other high brow brands or better quality brands, you would be like, why would I ever buy this? Like, why would you buy this instead of all the other brands? And again, what the thing I like about these kids is that they're, they're not afraid to, you know, um, have their stuff placed alongside, you know, some of the stalwart, some of the really storied brands, some of the brands that have a lot of history, a lot of experience, a lot of quality, a lot of talent. They're not afraid to, you know, to put them next to like, you know, really high price point stuff. But I'm sorry, like, there's no way you're buying. I'm buying this instead of I don't know whatever. Name me another brand that's better than this. Like, it's impossible. This jacket here is quite nice. I think the blue one there. That's probably the best bit I've seen here. And those trousers, they look really nice. That whole top, it's sort of look like a, a sort of like a. I wouldn't even call it a chore jacket. It's like a work jacket. I like the little clips here. Is it clips? Nice big jack pockets here. A, sort of like a half zip and buttons on top. That's that's a fairly nice jacket. Not gonna lie. I quite like the application of the hoodie here, but, you know, it doesn't look anything different than what you see from those brands on Twitter and Instagram, like Siberian Hills and all that sort of shit. Uh, it's just, a, I don't know, just basic as fuck, isn't it? This is probably the best thing of it, but again, it's one item for an entire capsule collection, probably not the best uh, return. But again, um, I guess if you're, if, you're that, if you're that way inclined, this is something that you like to see, then fair play to you. But for me, man, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand how this stuff is like, you know, Again, in stores like Barney's and selling, I guess, for the most part, because they're not going to keep, they won't give them a capsule collection if it's not doing in store, where in store. So I guess maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But again, not for me. Keep it moving. Uh, Travis Scott's Jordan Ones are really nice. Zuckerberg is learning a Tech and Society podcast. Okay, that's cool, cool to hear. Oh, these shirts by Waka Maria look really nice, aren't they? You seen these? Uh, what are these? Waka Maria. Uh, Waka Maria and Tim Leahy uh, channel uh, traditional Japanese art in a new collaboration. This is, looks fucking awesome. Waka Maria, man. Le legendary Japanese brand. A brand that I fucking, that I actually came across when I was interning at 12 Bar back in the day when I was like 18. That was like my first sort of introduction to the whole streetwear world and stuff. And um, I uh, was put onto 12 Bar. I uh, saw I was put onto Waka Maria through, I'm going to say through the guy from Garb, Garb, garb store um ian something whatever his name is right he put me onto that too uh that and sasquatch fabrics and shit he's the one that told me about these kind of brands um this looks fucking awesome man wow i love these shirts they, they're gonna be so again i think um we saw a lot of these sort of pattern shirts uh floral whatever they may be called uh in prior season especially last season uh during the fashion weeks loads of people loads of the kind of influence and stuff were wearing them around and i think we're gonna see more iterations coming out this summer especially with some of the high street stores picking them up especially some of the streetwear stores doing cut and sew collections we're only gonna see more of these kind of proliferating through so if you're fed up of uh, pattern shirts you better get more fed up because you're gonna see them everywhere and what's funny as well because you know what's interesting these are obviously done a little bit better quality than some of the shirts i've seen but um there when, when i went to primavera three years ago i think there was a moment when we were in Primavera, I think, uh, yeah, maybe three years ago, there was a moment when we were in there, and I think me and my friend noticed, like, w w this weird pattern where we kept seeing all these dudes wearing, like, cut-off jean shorts, right? They'd wear cut-off jean shorts, uh, some sort of sock that was, like, stacked down or pulled up, white or whatever sort of colour, bust-up vans or Reeboks or whatever kind of nondescript sort of, like, you know, low-top sneaker, and then a floral shirt, like a vintage shirt, whether it was a short sleeve, long sleeve, rolled up. That was what everyone was wearing. It was the exact same uniform on every single person. And it was so freaky to see. Like everyone was wearing the same sort of thing. Jean shorts, rolled up or like uh, cut very short to leave the fraying down there. Uh, white socks, Vans old schools and some shitty vintage shirt they got from like, I don't know, Beyond Retro or something, right? And it was so weird to see. But then nowadays you're seeing the same sort of trend happening with these floral shirts. And 
because it's come it come back and trend there and again i think for the dudes it's an easy way to kind of cheat on the festival outfit because you still get the kind of you know bit of pop on top with you know the pattern and the and the floors and shit and it's a bit loose the material you can sort of like have it loosely buttoned up maybe have a few buttons undone you can wear it with trousers wear it with jeans and you know and it works you know at night it works well during the day you're going to see them a lot again this season it's just not going to stop i think these shirts are turning into like the man's version, the male version of a bomber jacket. There was a there was a period where I was getting fed up of seeing bomber jackets everywhere. I think maybe that was when I was, yeah, I was just getting fed up of seeing it. Right, like you know, a design like Kim Jones. I don't think there's ever been every. I don't think there's ever been a collection of Kim Jones where he hasn't done a version of a bomber jacket. I think it's one of his favorite silhouettes. And I used to get really annoyed. You know, it's always do fucking bomber jackets. Do something else. Do something more interesting. Or like APC, right? They always have a bomber jacket in their collection. But then when you have a bomber jacket in your wardrobe. And you always keep wearing it. You start to realize why they're so important. Then it's literally a staple. It's like in the same vein as a trench coat, right? Uh, or a biker jacket or a pair of uh, light blue jeans. It's like you just need one in your wardrobe. That's simply it. And I think these floral shirts, even even though I hate them and they're very trendy and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna come and go. And because they're, they're gonna be really bad imitations of them coming up in the next few seasons, not this Waka Maria sort of stuff, but we're gonna see loads of really bad copies of these sort of uh, floral shirts. We're not gonna stop seeing them. I just think you have to accept it. They're gonna, they're gonna keep coming again and again and again. Especially like, come on, stuff like that. These kind of shorts, like you know, it's a no-brainer for a dude, man. If you're gonna go to a festival, go to a holiday. There's not many options that you can, you know, put. On. You know, there's not many options out there if you just have zany outfits without looking like a like a dullard. So these are the easiest way to do it with these sort of florals and these sort of easy patterns. So yeah, great collection there by Waka Maria. Recommend you check it out. Um, does the same one is kind of come out? Uh, should be out on the twenty seventh. Um, again, contact your local Waka Maria retailer to find out more. What else should we talk about here? What, where are we now? We're on nearly approaching the fifty minute mark. Let's keep going, Agostino. What do we have? What do we have? What do we have? Uh, Lululemon expansion to footwear. Who's gonna wear Lululemon trainers? Imagine that. Yeesh. Uh, Rico Nasi's got an album coming out. Marshall Lynch is reportedly retiring from NFL for 11th season. That's good. He opens an eBay store to spot like vintage office supplies and art books. Oh, awesome. Jound is fucking killing the game, isn't he, right now? Uh, did I have that on there, right? Did I have the Jound um, store? I must have put that on there. Did I put that on there? Oh, no, I didn't put that on there. I didn't put it on there, it doesn't look like... Anyway, um, let's talk about Tom Sachs. Tom Sachs, Tom Sachs. Tom Sachs, Tom Sachs. Where is it, where is it, where is it? This right here, John. I want, I want to get the other John news up as well because there's some really cool shit that he's been doing with Reebok that I thought has been quite cool and I want to highlight it. Um, where are we here? There we are. Okay, so um, Mr. Jown, Justin Saunders, a person that's been very much associated or attached with the whole Kanye Virgil Abloh crew, a person who I'm sure most of my readers or most of my listeners are familiar with through his uh, seminal blog spot, Jown, um, that I used to what I used to kind of browse all the fucking time. I fucking love that site. He doesn't update as much as he probably should do nowadays, but I'm guessing, you know, he's got so much stuff that he's doing now that he probably doesn't have the time to update it. But essentially it was like a visual mood board that he used to do. Um that he doesn't really do that much anymore. Um I'll show you it now on the screen so you guys can check it out. This is the John website and essentially it was just a list of images. And I think I remember the time uh, at the bottom of the of the website, he'd put a footer note, something along the lines of "Our oh, um, this will be a you, you, this is going to be your best, your favorite new site or something like that, or something along those kind of lines." Like really bold declaration, but after a period of time of him doing it, you kind of didn't recognize it. Yeah, it was the best site. Just amazing pictures sourced from all over the internet, kind of you know harkening back to the days, old days of of Tumblr, but done in a really tasteful way. Um, Loads of connection between the pictures, between how he uploaded them, uh, um, similarities in colors and hues. I remember there was a time when I was talking to some of my friends that were designers or some of my friends involved in the industry. I was saying to them, you know, I would just, if I was a designer or something, I would literally use Jound as my kind of mood board. Especially if you're doing a small collection or you're trying to check the temperature of what's currently going on. You could easily interpret loads of actual cues of what's happening in the current culture through what you see on Jound. 
just amazingly tasteful images, really incredible detail. Um, I love some of the essential stuff. Some of the outfits that he put on there were fucking awesome too. Like stuff like this, you know, the collect the the combination of these jeans and these vintage vans is no coincidence in terms of the colours. Just great stuff. Architecture, cars, uh, product design, stuff like this, the cardboard box, the colours and tones and hues. Um, office supplies which he's always been kind of um, secretly obsessed with just loads of great amazing things that you kind of like look at this label extra small like just amazing amazing photography amazing pictures just all around just great stuff and sometimes you slip in the odd um, item promotion like this right so you can then click that and go on to stuff that he's actually selling just great stuff vintage um, um stan smith's there Look at the shape on the video shoes. You just can't get that nowadays with stuff now, and it? it's just well. That being said, Adidas are doing quite a good job of you know making sure they put uh, vintage last on some of their older shoes. But again, just amazingly uh, amazing high quality stuff from John, right? Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. So now he's kind of you know he he kind of rose to prominence um, through kind of his work on there, and I think but loads of those dudes like Virgil and stuff kind of saw his work and immediately kind of reached out to him. I used to kind of talk to him through email as well back in the day. I was very much inspired by what he done and just kind of congratulated him and told him to keep going what he was doing. And you know again, it's not really I'm not I'm I'm no one's chilly, and I'm sure he knew he was smashing it anyway. But you know people need a bit of encouragement here and there. I just kind of loved what he was doing anyway. Um, so he's progressed. He's gone really far. He's had collaborations with Vans. He's done other collaborations with, I think, the, I can't remember the Candle Company, the collaboration with the Bicycle. He's done loads of great collaborations, but now he's sort of kind of, you know, reaching, he's kind of pumped, where now every collaboration he puts out, for the exception of maybe a couple of the shoes that he's done, that have maybe the in-house shoes he's done with the kind of like New Balances, I don't think they sold out. I'm not sure if they did. But so far, he's done really great work. And now he's done a, he's kind of has a long, it seems like a long-term partnership with Reebok, which has been really interesting. Um, Against a brand that isn't really in the zeitgeist at the moment. It's a brand that maybe doesn't really get the shine it probably should do it's a brand that i'm not necessarily a fan of because of the connotations i have with it with growing up in the east east end of london you know with you know scabby kids in my neighborhood wearing them it being associated with the bmp and national front you know it's got a bit of a weird tint to it for me personally and only for me right so i didn't really get the obsession with reebok especially during the skating skating world where loads of brands are kind of collaborating with them and trying to wear tracksuit bottoms with i don't know it's just anyway it's a bad idea you know just kind of pretend rude boys you know the ones i'm talking about so but John is, uh, has been able, just as has been able to do a collaboration with Reebok and do it the right way. Do it in a way that makes me actually want to buy the shoes, which is fucking rare. And if you know me, you know I hate Reebok with all my heart. Even even though I love CrossFit and I'm a big CrossFit enthusiast, I, there's no way in hell that I'm ever going to wear a pair of Reeboks. But he's done this collaboration so well that it's actually making me consider doing it. Um, so this is an installation that he's currently doing with um, Reebok. It's a, it's a pop-up shop that he's launched. And it's it basically it's in a, it's, it's, it looks like it's outfitted in the same vein as our old school um, sports supply, um, sports equipment, sports supply shops. If you remember back in the day, like a sports um, sports direct, how it used to be, like those kind of shelves with the kind of, you know, white shelves with a kind of clip on um, shelving units they put on there. Uh, very sterile environment bereft of any kind of personality but very much harkening back to the good old days right and he's done an entire collection it looks like with Reebok um in, tied in with it with merch and then he's done another side of the, of the collaboration where it's sort of like a, a homage to the olden days he's picked up loads of stuff loads of vintage items that he's then selling on eBay to raise money I think also, I think raising money I'm not too sure what the deal was with that but for the rest of that the collection just looks so cool loads of Mar Grey which is, he's obviously obsessed with I'm sure the fit of the sweatshirt is going to be awesome. Probably going to be like 50s, 60s fit. Very boxy. No Wrangler sleeves there. Um, again, uh, loads of nice towels. The Reebok, the Reebok trainers, obviously. Uh, sweatpants done in the bright way. Hoodies. Uh, tote bags hats just really great staples that every guy can use in their wardrobe just amazing 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 stuff that's one image from the collection there from the actual in, in uh interior design of the store then what else do we have here we have here the actual um cat is that look like the cash point right where you kind of actually go and buy purchase the things you've got a table here again just great furniture around the whole place uh, interior design is absolutely spot on this is the whole entire unit um, shop display selling all the vintage items, which I'm sure has been sourced and now is going to be sold. I have seen sold on eBay. Again, probably stuff he's picked up over the, over time. He's always been a stickler for really old vintage books, which I've also been a fan of. But, you know, I usually pick my eyes up at charity shops and stuff for the most part. Um, again, just really great stuff. Like massive fucking Xerox printing machine. Harkening back to good old days again. Just great, 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 great stuff. I'm a huge fan of John and I think he's doing amazing work. I just think, again, it's a credit to him. They've been able to take a Tumblr blog, 
to this height. Basically, he's turned himself into a consultant. He probably was a consultant at the beginning. And he just essentially used the power of the internet to kind of harness his message, to broadcast it to more people. And to basically, he basically used his Tumblr or his Blogspot or his, um, his account. You remember, he used to actually be on Blog. I'm not sure if he's moved it. But he basically used it as like a business card. Right, as a, as a living and breathing CV, as a living and breathing portfolio of people to check out and see. And now look at where he is at now. He's, you know what I mean? He's, he's helping out with Virgil and Kanye. He's doing loads of other brand consulting work. He's, he's got an entire collection under the helm of Reebok. I love the kind of store. I love the store entry uh, sign too about the business hours, right? Uh, Monday, not sure. Tuesday, maybe. Wednesday, perhaps. Thursday, unclear. Friday, probably not. Saturday, possibly. Sunday, I don't know. Like, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Just great attention to detail. Again, stationary bits and pieces as well. I'm sure you just take... Oh, it's like an ordering sheet, I'm assuming, right? You pick it up and then you tick off the things that you want or circle the things that you want. Just great shit, man. Great stuff. Um, really, really impressed by him. He's absolutely smashing it. Um, that's Jown's uh, pop-up shop. Um, uh, real pop-up shop. For the, Re for the Reebok Club C85. And when's that shoe, shoe going to come out? Oh, so opening April 27th. So opening at the end of the week. So if I guess if you're in and around, is it in Canada, right? Yes, in Quebec. So if you're in and around Montreal, go and check that out because he it, that stuff would not be hanging around. Uh, next on the list here is my idol, somebody I've always looked up to, um, Tom Sachs. Again, another person who's kind of rose to prominence over the years uh, through his association, his network, somebody who's obviously in the scene. I think if you're plugged in and you're aware of the movers and shakers in, in the art world and you're aware of the people in New York who are really pushing things forward and you just know where things come from, you're aware of the DNA, the lineage, you'll be familiar with Tom Sachs anyway. But if you're not, I think his network of friends, his recent collaboration, especially with Virgil, his stuff to do with Nike recently, have really kind of rose into prominence and given the platform that he's always kind of, I thought, always kind of greatly deserved. And now it seems like he's doing uh, more collections with Nike. Um, the the version of the Nike shoe that I have at the moment, the Mars Yard, he's updated that with the shoe that you have here on the screen, which I really desperately want. It's sort of like a, pa a parachute um, sock kind of thing that I want to buy eventually. Um, and now he's kind of kind of outfitted it out with an entire Nike Crafts kind of clothing collection, which looks exactly like the shoes, right? Got these really, I just love that haberdashery kind of like, you know, um, pasty, really rough around the edges look of his work. Like he's always very much obsessed with showing everyone how things are put together, never really hiding seams or making things flushed, always kind of overexposing the stitching, contrast stitching, showing where all the flipping claspings and knots and bolts and stuff go. It's just really cool. I love his aesthetic and I'm just so glad that he's been able to kind of maintain that same level of standard or same level of aesthetic when he kind of works with big brands. Because sometimes it can be hard to do when you go work for a big corporation to take your vision and kind of plug into what they do, right? It's sometimes, you know, you can kind of get lost in the kind of finesse machine of manufacturing. You know, Nike are big players and don't fuck around. So um, it's great to see him doing that um what else uh keep going on look at that it's got a poncho so he's got a little messenger bag there's a poncho there too that looks fucking great uh again made in vietnam tom Sachs, also down the back look how great that poncho looks with the with the kind of um what you staple workwear jacket you'd say that you see tom Sachs wearing for the most part right the staple chore jacket that's well familiar with him seeing again the poncho here worn here at the back the side jacket with the kind of hat on top, which looks great. It looks like a sort of like a swimming hat, doesn't it? I'm not sure if it is a swimming hat. That's really nice with the 10 bullets in the front. He's sort of like mantra. Um, again, just great shit. Right? Putting a pencil here in the back of the hat. Just great. Awesome attention to detail. Really great aesthetic. Um, oh, look at these fucking shorts. Massive. Amazing. Sort of like down shorts, right? <laughs> so awesome. With a web class on the front. Again, really, really great stuff from Tom Sachs. I'm a real big fan of the stuff that he does. I'm really trying to go and get those trainers when they when I eventually get around to getting them because they came out a few times in it a couple of times ago. I think they were priced quite highly too in retail. I think they were like five hundred dollars or something, but you can find them quite easily now on resale sites like StockX and stuff. So that should be cool. And then lastly on this Tom Sachs stuff to tie in with the collection is that he's doing a pop up shop in Tokyo now at the moment at Beams. Um you should check out if you're in the area too. Beams is essentially like a, a kind of higher brown Uniqlo. They were kind of the brand that I discovered before Uniqlo. Uh, they do really great staples, um, obviously Japanese, amazing staples like rain jackets, butt-down jackets, 
cargo pants, just like great staples done in a very streetwear kind of aesthetic way, but done on a mass market level. And then I think they've got uh, different versions. They've got Beams Plus, Beams, whatever, kind of different versions of it, different tiers. Uh, but yeah, a great place. A sort of like staple again in New York. I mean, sort of staple again in Japan to go check out. Um, so this is these, this is pop, Tom Sykes pop up shop there. I think a few people flew out for the actual shop uh, being launched. This is the iconic sort of national chairs, folding chairs that he has with um, names of like legendary artists and influencers on the back of the chair. You've got Sid Barrett. You've got Abraham Lincoln there on the back, um, which looks fucking cool as fuck. Let's get that back up on the screen there. Da, 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 da. you got here, amazing display. Got the, the NASA, NASA logo t-shirt that sold that really quickly. I, and at the back of it, it says, it won't fail because of me. Looks awesome. You've got these great little keys with the screwdrivers at the end of it, which are a great little tool to have in your pocket or something like that, right? You never know when there's times where you might need to have a little screwdriver handy to open something or to unbox something. That's a really cool idea. I like the pens again. Just really great st st stationery. Look at the links between Jan and Tom Sachs. Jan's probably the evolution of Tom Sachs, right? Dan and a, Jan's probably the minimalist version of Tom Sachs, like, you know? Like really, really cool. They're all those, they're all obsessed with stationery and books and really kind of old school ways of doing things, right? Um, again, they've got the taste ceremonial manual, which I, I've got on my Amazon wish list. You've got the playing cards that sold out. I was wanting to get so annoyed by it. You've got this great lamp, just awesome, awesome shit from Tom Sachs um, in this uh, pop up store and beams. I recommend you check it out. Um, it's going to be around, I think, for a while, isn't it? I remember it saying, let me check the, what the article say. It's going to be around until the 6th of May, so it's quite a long time. So if you're around the area, I recommend you check it out. Tom Sachs at Beams. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff from the guy. Um, yeah, great, great stuff, man. And that is one hour, isn't it? One hour on the spot. Thanks for tuning in again to Exxon Zinger Show, episode number 184. Uh, it's been a been a blast to have you in my company. I need to get you off to work now, and I'm going to see you guys again maybe later on today, if not tomorrow. Um, pray for Man United if you can, if you care. Pray for us if you don't care. I guess you want to laugh, and I'll see you guys again very soon. All info regarding myself is in the link below, axelzinger.com. If you're watching through YouTube, click on like and subscribe. If you're on the podcast app, leave me a little five star review. That would be greatly appreciated so people can find out what I'm doing and what I'm about. And I'll see you guys again very very soon. Peace out.